So I will be talking about also timing, searches for gravitational waves from the most massive black holes. Um, in short, that means pulsar timing rays will detect gravitational waves. And those will tell something about black holes. Um, I will start off by giving you a bit of a basic introduction into how pulsar timing works. Not because that is terribly important, but because that really lays the basis of fundamental of what I'll be talking about. Um, but I'll try to make that fairly brief. Then I will try to outline exactly what we can learn when we make a detection, uh, with a focus, of course, on the black holes rather than uh, the gravitational waves themselves. Um, if I have time, I'll also briefly mention um, the potential that a pulsar around Sagittarius A star might hold. That this that has not really anything to do with gravitational wave searches, um, but it very much has to do with pulsar timing, and in fact, that might be um, a very exciting prospect as well. So, first of all, pulsars, pulsar timing, and then how do we use pulsars to detect gravitational waves? Well, as I think most of you know, pulsars or neutron stars, um, they're very compact objects. Um, that typically don't radiate because there's no nuclear fusion at the core, but they do, for some reason, emit waves from their magnetic poles. Now, the fact that their magnetic axis and their rotation axis are offset means that these beams of radiation get swept around in space, and if the alignment is opportune, like in this video here, you get a pulse of radiation passing by every once in a while, hence the name pulsating stars or pulsars. Now, if that radiation beam, if that rotation is stable enough and that radiation beam goes nicely like in this clip, then you can mathematically predict when these pulses should arrive. Um, this is just an, like a basic, to give you a basic idea of, of what kind of things go in there, you've got, of course, the spin frequency of the pulsar, it's spin down as it loses energy and rotates slower in time. There's dispersive effects to do with the electron density in the interstellar medium. R and S are vectors that point from the solar system barycenter to the Earth, as well as the Earth goes around the Sun, uh, that changes the length of the travel path of the photons and that to be taken into account. The other vector points in the direction of the pulsar, so depending on where in the sky the pulsar is, of course, the path length might be different. The velocity of the pulsar as it moves in the sky, and a whole lot of other terms, especially when the pulsar is in a binary system, so that you take into account um, every uh, motion in that binary system, and of course, especially if you were to detect a pulsar around Sagittarius A star, that would be where all the interesting science lies. So, you have your model, you have your observations, you can subtract one from the other, resulting in the residuals, predictably. What do they typically look like? Something like this. On the x-axis here, you have the date of the observation. On the y-axis, you have the residual. Now, the residual, contains everything that is not in your timing model, but that does happen in reality. So to first order here, what you can see is just measurement error, just Gaussian random scatter. Um, you know it's there, you can't predict it though, so it will always be there. What you can do is improve your observing setup so that that scatter gets less and less in time as your systems improve. And as, it, as you do push down that white noise, you might get sensitive to other effects that lie underneath the noise. Now, this is a very nice plot because it shows that everything is nice and, and predictable. Um, to be completely frank, this is not always the case in the sense that we can't use every pulsar for this game. To get a better idea of which pulsars we can use, um, we'll look at this PP dot diagram. This is the basic diagram of pulsar astronomy. It's got the pulse period on the x-axis and its spin down rate on the y-axis, and you immediately notice one big group, which we call the young or slow pulsars here. Now if you time those, and George Hobbs did this a while ago, um, if you time those typically, the residuals look like this. Now, this doesn't look at all like what we saw in the previous slide. This is a huge signal. Um, it's not Gaussian in any way, um, but it's also not predictable. It is some instability, either in the pulsar's interior or in the magnetosphere of the pulsar, and the problem is, so far, nobody has been able to explain it in a way that we can model it and subtract it. Um, so that means these pulsars, and this is about 90% of the population you can't really use for gravitational, wave, for gravitational wave detection, not yet, that is. There's, however, a different group. There's the millisecond pulsars.
ultrasound here with much faster spin periods, and those are the ones which I showed an example of in the previous slide. Those are stable, those are well behaved. Whatever affects these guys does not seem to affect those guys, at least not at the level that we are sensitive. So when we talk about gravitational wave detection with pulsars, it's these guys that we talk about. It's only about 10% of the population, but um, so far it looks like they will be sufficient. Um, I told you just then that these are the timing residuals. That means everything that happens in nature, but that we did not put in our models, should be in there at some level. And so there's several things that we know should be in there. Of course, guys, from measurement errors are measured already. The intrinsic pulsar instabilities, as I said, for millisecond pulsars, they're not really seen yet, but they might be at a lower level where we can't see them yet. I mentioned that the interstellar dispersion comes into the formula. Well, if that varies in time, that is something we also see in the residual, then we should correct for it. And of course, finally, gravitational waves are there. Now, that shows that, and this is not an exhaustive list. There are other things which we know are there, uh, like solar system errors, maybe. Um, this shows that there's a lot of stuff in that noise, and that it's not as straightforward as to just, you know, see the gravitational waves. We need some way of distinguishing them from all the other sources of noise. Um, and so that is through correlation, because the gravitational waves, of course, they have a quadrupolar correlation, and so they are uniquely identifiable from all the other sources. Um, specifically, we tend to use the Hellings and Downs um, correlation <coughs> curve as presented in the 80s, where you have, for each pair of pulsar mass in your array, you can have the angle between the pulsars on the sky here, and you can correlate the timing residuals, and this curve gives you the expected correlation due to the gravitational waves. Um, these, plot, these dots here are just a simulation to show what an actual detection might look like. Um, so that's how it works. You time your pulsars, get residuals, cross-correlate, and you get this curve. Um, we are, of course, not the only ones playing this game. Um, again, I don't need to go into this plot in detail because it's been shown before, but I did want to point out that um, it's actually maybe something that the Planck satellite might come, become important in this game very soon as well. Um, to give you an idea where we stand, and again, I cross over in the previous talk a bit, but not too much. Uh, this is a plot that Alberto Sassana made recently. In fact, it's a slight variation of his 2013 publication, um, which is preparing for an upcoming uh, paper. And it shows you for four different um, scenarios of, of black hole evolution, or binary black hole evolution, um, shows you the predicted amplitude range of the gravitational waves. Uh, it also shows these two points, which are, top point is the currently best published limit on gravitational waves from pulsar timing. The lower point is also shown in the previous talk, is the best unpublished limit um, submitted by Shannon et al. a while ago. It should appear in publication hopefully in the next week, uh, in the next couple of weeks. Now, compared to these bands, you know, that bottom point is starting to get quite constraining. Um, the top point is not too impressive, but this red box here is to remind you of the expected gravitational wave amplitude range that we were working with until Alberto came out with this paper. Um, and so, compared to that range, we were actually doing quite well and getting quite low. Um, now Alberto has sent us back a bit, but we're not desperate yet. Um, we'll definitely keep pushing these points down as we, for example, combine our international data. Um, and as we do so, of course, you can see different models predict different amplitudes. You might be able to distinguish between the different models and how exactly do supermassive binary black holes evolve. <coughs> so that already gets into the next topic of my talk, is what kind of gravitational wave sources do we have and what can we learn about them? First of all, the stochastic gravitational wave background. Um, there's a talk tomorrow by Marta Volontari, which is pretty much exactly on this, so I'll keep this very short in order not to steal too much of her talk. Um, comes down to the fact that hierarchical galaxy formation, which is the standard paradigm for galaxy evolution and galaxy growth, predicts that galaxies grow through merger. This implies that the central supermassive black holes at the centers of those galaxies become binaries and eventually merge. The gravitational waves that these binaries produce can be detected in pulsar timing array band, and so the details will be shown tomorrow. Um, an example of what that would look like 
like, again, a fault by Alberto. Um, this is, again, the power spectrum characteristic strain of gravitational waves on the y-axis, observing frequency on the x-axis. And each of these green dots, they've only been plotted up to this line because here it gets too crowded anyway. But each of these dots is a supposed, a simulated supermassive black hole binary somewhere in the universe. And the red line is the combined strain of all of these sources. Now, in most cases, there's so many sources in each frequency bin that you really can't distinguish one from another, and that's why it's a stochastic background you're looking at. As we'll see in a bit, a few of these sources, and those are the red triangles, they really stand out far beyond anything else in the frequency bin, and so those could be possible to be detected um, as a single source. Um, now, the problem, if we detect a gravitational wave background, as opposed to a single source, and of course the problem is that I can't really derive any information on an individual black hole, which might be a bit disappointing for most of you, um, but we should be able to get population statistics out. Um, I think the best paper to look at in that context is still uh, this one from 2008, Cesana Regio and um, And just to give you the brief summary, again, it's population statistics, it's no individual black hole measurements, and that's why I think we might go over this a bit fast. Um, if we detect a gravitational wave background, that shows that the final classic problem, that the black holes can't get too close enough together to coalesce, that that is solved in nature, that that is not an issue. Because otherwise the gravitational wave background wouldn't be there. Um, we can probe the supermassive black, binary black hole <coughs> population just by measuring the amplitude, essentially. And as I showed in the other plots, the black hole um, host relationships, they really define what the spectrum will look like. And so that we shall be able to constrain. Also, the local interaction of the supermassive black holes with the gas and the stars around the black hole, that should have a big impact on exactly what spectrum we will detect. And eccentricities, um, that's a bit of a difficult one. There hasn't been very much work on it because it's a quite complicated problem. But again, that would in influence the, the exact shape of the spectrum. Um, so all of these things, um, statistically, there should be some information there which we can pull out. More interestingly, I think, for black hole science would be that kind of point where a single source stands out and you can actually measure, um, detect that single source. Now, to fully understand what we can do with that, let's look a bit at the impact of those gravitational waves, of those supermassive binary black holes, on the timing residuals. And this is the timing residual function of time. This is typically what um, such a binary black hole would do. Um, it's dependent on a few angles, but most importantly, the amplitude, of course, has two components for the two polarizations of the gravitational wave. Um, and the big important point of this slide is that that amplitude only depends on the evolution of the gravitational waves at the Earth and the evolution of the gravitational waves at the pulsar. Um, just to show you an example, if you take the, the proposed supermassive binary black hole in the radio galaxy 3C66b, as, as published in Sudo et al. 2003, um, they have a quite wide range of, of predicted masses, but if you take that top uh, mass, the, the, the top of their range, you can actually predict for a given pulsar what that signature would look like in the timing residuals. And what you see is two things. First of all, you see this very high frequency wobble. That is the Earth tone. That is what the pulsar does. Well, that's what the, the gravitational waves do at the Earth. Um, it's got a high frequency because it's a fairly late stage of the binary evolution. The second thing you see is this very low frequency wobble. That is the pulsar tone. That is an earlier stage of the binary evolution because that signal first traveled as a gravitational wave to the pulsar and then printed in the photons from the pulsar traveled to Earth, so we made a detour. That means you probe an earlier phase of the binary black hole evolution. So in the previous talk, when you had that a big triangle of sources where you can't measure the evolution in a 10-year observation, this problem sort of, well, has the potential of solving that because essentially 
even though you've only been observing for 10 years, because you also have the pulsar term, which adds an extra delay of several hundreds to thousands of years, gives you that extra le leverage, which can actually help you to see evolution even in those systems. Um, that plot, by the way, was courtesy of Rick Genet and collaborators who compared it to the actual time residuals and concluded that, okay, this particular realization of that proposed supermass black hole is not real. We would have seen it in the data if it was. Uh, just to show that there are you know, proposed systems out there which we could already be sensitive to. Now, when we detect a single a gravitational wave of a supermassive binary black hole system, um, what can we get out in terms of gravitational wave science? Um, first paper I would like to discuss here is Sasana Vecchio, 2010. They went through a lot of trouble to figure out that, with fairly reasonable assumptions, um, binaries with a chirp mass of more than 10 to the 8 solar masses, so these are quite massive systems indeed, at a redshift of up to 1.5, should be detectable. They have a big problem though in the sense that the effect on the residual scales with this um, division where M is the chirp mass and D, e, D L is the luminosity distance. And so what they find is that by just looking at the Earth term, that is the gravitational wave term that is correlated um, between all the pulsars, um, you cannot really measure the mass of the supermassive black hole or the distance. You can only really measure the ratio, and that is the problem. Furthermore, they find that if you do this analysis, typically you get the source location precision on the sky of about 40 square degrees, which means that it's far too big to identify an optical counterpart, so you can't get a distance in that way either, which is a bit disappointing. Now, they only consider monochromatic sources, because indeed most of these do not evolve over the limited time span that we have in the Earth term alone. And they only consider circular, as I said earlier, uh, eccentric is a bit difficult. There's another thing you can do though, and Corbin and Cornish did that in the same year, is you can try and look at the pulsar term as well. And that gives you some more information. Uh, however, it's a bit difficult to get that term out, because if you don't know the distance to the pulsars well enough, um, you, you can't really figure out what this term would be. So what they did was through a Bayesian analysis, um, they marginalized over the pulsar distance to get both the pulsar distance and a handle on the pulsar term. Um, that, of course, meant that they also looked at evolving gravitational wave sources um, because the time scales are much longer, as I said. And once you have evolution, you can derive a supermassive black hole binary mass from that independently, and then you can break that covariance and hence get the distance independently. Also, because they are using more information than um, just the Earth term, they can also get the resolution on the sky down by quite a bit Three square degrees is still not amazing, but, but it's starting to get interesting. Um, the only problem with their analysis is that they assume a pretty high signal to noise for the gravitational wave detection, and for the foreseeable future, uh, this might be a bit too optimistic. We'll have to wait for the square kilometer array probably to do that. Then another paper on single source detection, all in the same year. Uh, KJ Lee at the Max Planck in Bonn. Um, wrote the following one, and he also used the pulsar term, um, but instead of deriving the pulsar distances, he actually um, gets the pulsar distances independently. And so this inherently is huge. You have a square kilometer array with a large sensitivity, large enough that you can measure the parallax of, of the pulsars either through VLBI or timing. Um, and then when you know the distance of the pulsar, it's much easier to get the pulsar term as well. Uh, they restricted themselves to monochromatic sources, which you may argue about whether that is a smart thing to do or not. Um, but you could expand it, the, the, the principles hold. Um, and again, only circular. The big improvement that they made with respect to the other uh, groups was that they realized that there is a, a sort of interference pattern between the pulsar and the Earth term, which allows you to give a, a, a very precise localization of the sky. Um, that is not very clear, but if you look at an image like this one, it might become clear. Um, here, essentially, you can imagine if the Earth is at the center and the black hole binary is at an angle of zero, 
And as a function of where the pole star is, at what angle from the supermassive binary black hole, you can see how sensitive the pole star is to the gravitational waves that come from the binary. So of course, if the pole star and the black hole are aligned, then the pole star only goes exactly the same uh, gravitational wave effect as the Earth, as so you get es essentially you get destructive interference, which means they have no sensitivity at all. If the pole star moves off a bit at a slight angle, where the detour of the gravitational waves ends up being exactly half a wavelength, you get positive interference and a lot of sensitivity. Um, as, as you go as a function of that angle, you get a very fine fringe pattern, which is for one pulsar, for all the other pulsars in your array, you get that same fringe pattern, and so you can combine all those to get a very precise um, position measurement. So typically they get a precision of about less than one square degree, I'll show you some, deep, some more detail in, in a moment which should allow for easy identification of the optical counterpart, which then may allow you to get a distance that way, and hence break the covariance and get the mass out um, as such. This is an example of what that um, the, the localization would look like. I'm not sure if it's terribly clear, but these white stars here are the pulsars in your array. You see they are surrounded by these rings from the interference pattern. And there's a tiny red point right there, which is where all the interference patterns come together, and that is where you would identify the source location to be. Um, this is in a bit more detail the sensitivity they get. For an assumed pulsar timing array with 20 pulsars, which is a bit on the low side, we can definitely do more. With a timing precision of 50 nanoseconds, which is a bit optimistic, but for the SKA it may be possible. Um, and an average pulsar distance of about one kiloparsec, which is reasonable. They get an amplitude sensitivity of a bit below 10 to the minus 16, and this is the source localization on the sky. At that amplitude, well, at, at smaller amplitudes, of course, you, you have no localization because you can't see gravitational waves. At higher amplitudes, so the wavelength you can detect, um, you actually get localizations of about 10 to the minus 5 or better, uh, so definitely less than. Um, on square degree. Um, so for this array, they typically get a sensitivity of H naught of a bit better than 10 to the minus 16. Given this relationship, you can translate that as being sensitive to about um, to supermassive binary black hole systems of about 20 mega solar masses um, up to about 2 megaparsecs. So just to give you an idea of what we are probing. Um, so that's all very promising, of course, the main problem is that, yes, you require very high timing precision, not only for the gravitational wave detection, but also uh, to get the distances which they need um, initially. Now, most of these uh, papers from 2010 were essentially analytical, and they didn't really go through the entire process of simulated data and, and realistic pipelines. Um, that work is more recent. Um, here at AEI, in collaboration with um, Paris, there's been a bit of work on a um, genetic algorithm to pick out single sources um, from a simulated data set. This plot shows you the pulsars in the array, which there are a bit on the lab, and there's a bit too few maybe to be realistic, but it's not that far off. The crosses which you may or may not see are where the gravitational wave sources were put into the simulation and the circles are where the genetic algorithm took them out. Um, essentially they are all completely coincident and that is, um, well that's the news that shows that it works very well. Uh, the problem again though is that these simulations are still a bit too realistic um, to be true right now. Um, but the code is working and very soon it should be applied to real data to see if there's anything in there. Um, the main piece of ongoing work with the, this method is that they haven't actually figured out their uncertainties yet. So it's a bit hard to compare to the, the previous things I mentioned. Um, a similar analysis <coughs> which does have its uncertainties figured out was developed at the University of uh, Wisconsin in Milwaukee, where again they have the same detection of the frequency and the sky location in two coordinates, um, and then they could also fit with the uncertainties. The, the method is pretty similar to the one developed here at the AEI. Um, so that is all possible. 
Um, but again, these are all simulations. This is not actual limits on, on real sources. Um, this is currently still the most up-to-date publication on single source limits from the uh, Australian group uh, from three years ago. And again, you have the frequency on the x-axis, the gravitational wave strain on the y-axis, um, and essentially this dotted curve is the most sensitive curve when they combine all their pulsars. Now, bear in mind that this is a sky average plot, so depending on exactly where the gravitational wave source is, you may actually have more sensitivity than this curve uh, leads you to believe. They also put in the, pulsar, uh, the Earth and the pulsar terms for the 3C66b um, candidate that Janelal talked about earlier. Um, and I show you that is as expected above the, the sensitivity of the curve. Um, this is uh, an outlier like we saw in, in the Susana plot with many green circles. So this is typically where an outlier might lie. Um, and this is another supermassive black hole binary candidate. Um, but again, these curves are very dependent on the position in the sky, so this is sort of a worst case scenario limit. Um, and reasonably well in time, so I have time to, to ponder the possibilities of Sagittarius A star. Um, the potential of probing black holes and the gravity surrounding black holes um, is enormous if we were to find a pulsar around Sagittarius A star. Just last year, the, the group in Bonn again um, published a nice paper where they essentially show how you can test all of these things at pretty high precision, even if um, you have a pulsar that isn't particularly nice to time. Um, there's a few problems. The main problem is you need a pulsar that is relatively close to Sagittarius A star. Um, and we don't have a pulsar like that. Now, the space around Sagittarius A star is, without a doubt, the most surveyed piece of sky for pulsars. Um, there's been an enormous amount of surveys around there, um, and so far we haven't found anything. The reasons for that were always expected to be essentially strong scattering, that the medium, the, the area around Sagittarius A star is so messy, there's so much gas and dust and everything, that multi-path scattering makes your pulse spread out so that eventually you just have a continuum source, which of course you can't time. Um, that means you'd like to do your survey at higher observing frequencies because the scattering angles get less and therefore this doesn't become a problem anymore. However, pulsars are steep spectral index objects, that means at high frequencies they're very faint, so you want to go to low frequencies, and this um, clash of, of interest really means that it's very hard to survey on such an area they start. Um, a very interesting thing, however, happened quite recently, and this is the main reason I wanted to mention this, is in April of this year, uh, the New Star satellite discovered a 3.76 second pulsar around, well, in the neighborhood of Sagittarius they start actually quite close um, to the supposed location of the supermassive black hole. So that's very exciting, because this could finally be the pulsar that we've always looked for. Um, so immediately, within a matter of days, Pretty much every telescope, especially radio, but also some higher frequency telescopes, pointed at that location to see whether it was there. Um, as is often the case with, with bursting pulsars, the first few days nothing was seen, but then after a while the radio also turned on and actually pulsations were seen. The object was studied in great detail. Um, and there were some really fascinating finds. The dispersion measure, which is a measure of the integrated electron density to the source, is about 4,000, which is by far the largest that we have found. Um, and that is very strongly suggestive that the source would be somewhere in the galactic center. The H1 column density derived from the uh, X-ray observations was also high enough to make such a location plausible. Um, the rotation measure, which is a combination of the, the electron density and the magnetic field along the line of sight, is also extremely high by a factor of 10 higher than the um, highest other pulsar observation we have so far. Um, and we were able not only to measure the spin period, but also the spin down rate. 
which means we can now identify what kind of pulsar this is. Turns out it's a radio magnetar, and given that it is so far away, it may well be at the tangent point to the galactic center, so about 0.1 parsec away from Sagittarius A star. Um, that is, if you want to be, if you want to hold a pessimistic view, that's sort of the end of the good news. Um, this is where the key and the don't place it. So I told you before, these poles actually count time very precisely. These are very good. Well, this one lies in an even different part of the parameter space, the magnetar part, which um, really is a bit problematic, and we'll have to see just how precisely we can find this object. Um, the other problem, and this may be more fundamental, is that this is the pulse profile, and note this is 5% of the orbital pit of, of the pulse period, which means that smearing out of the pulse, which we were always so worried about, that doesn't seem to affect this at all. Um, which means we didn't find anything in the galactic center. We thought that was because the pulses were all smeared out because of the inhomogeneities in the medium. This seems to suggest that that was not the reason. Why it was the reason, then, we don't know. So why did we not see pulsars before? Is that because scattering really happens differently than we expect? Or is it because there simply are no pulsars and that would be dramatic? Now, I don't want to go to that extreme. There are many things, and, and as I said, this is very recently happened, so there's many things to figure out. Um, and probably this one is a bit too far from the galactic center, so we probably can't do much with it. Um, but at least there's something there. Um, so I'd say, watch this space. Um, it's still very early days, but this looks very exciting. You could have very big ramifications. Um, I think, yeah, I did manage to make up some time, thanks to, partly thanks to the good introduction I got from the previous speaker. So I'll leave you with this. Um, pulsar timing, gravitational wave detections should arrive relatively soon if the models that we are hunting down are anything to go by. Um, whether we'll detect a background or a single source is hard to tell. Both seem pretty likely at this point. If we do detect a single supermassive binary black hole, that would be very interesting for black hole science. Um, but probably we need better precision, better sensitivity, and so we may have to wait for the square kilometer array, which will come up um, early in the next decade, if we're lucky. And such a is a star. Finally, Pulsar was found quite close to the central black hole. Um, it might be a bit disappointing to some, but uh, it's still very early days and we need to be a bit careful in our analysis and see where it really is and what we can really do with it. Thank you very much for your attention.